Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 33, The Madness of Justin II. Justinian died in his sleep on November the 14th, 565, and in what was something of a tradition for 6th century emperors, he had named no successor. He had no children of his own, but had many relatives who would quite happily fill the vacancy. So perhaps to keep the peace, the emperor had decided to leave the decision to the last moment, until, of course, the moment passed from him. As I briefly touched on a few episodes ago, Justinian's cousin Germanus had been the heir apparent until his death in 550. His two sons, named respectively and respectfully Justin and Justinian, were obvious candidates to be emperor. While slightly confusingly, the other main contender was also named Justin. He was the son of Justinian's sister, Vigilantia. Obviously, everyone in the family was naming their firstborn Justin in acknowledgement of the uncle who had led them all to a better life in the capital. The latter Justin had been favoured by Theodora, and she encouraged him to marry her own niece, Sophia, a woman who admired and emulated her powerful aunt. And it was this Justin, the emperor's nephew, who would succeed to the throne. Both Germanus's sons were well-liked military commanders, but they were off serving in the imperial armies when the emperor died. Justin, like his uncle and great-uncle before him, was working in the palace. For the last 14 years, he had been the Curo Pilates, or supervisor of the palace. It was initially an honorific title, but Justin worked to gain more influence over the operations of the vast complex, and as you know, during Justinian's reign, all questions and decisions came to and from the palace. When Justinian was found dead, a loyal chamberlain found Justin and told him that the emperor's final words were to appoint his nephew as his successor. Even if the scenario itself sounded unlikely, the appointment was far more believable than Justin I's had been when Anastasius died. The Senate quickly accepted this turn of events, in part perhaps because the new emperor had the full support of the excubitors, the imperial bodyguard. One of the more influential moves that Justin had made during his stint as Curo Pilates was getting his friend Tiberius appointed as Count of the Excubitors. So by the morning of November the 15th, the Byzantines had themselves a new emperor, Justin II. After being crowned by the patriarch, Justin led a procession which took Justinian's body to the Church of the Holy Apostles, another of his amazing constructions which was believed to be the inspiration for St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. Then it was on to greet the crowds in the Hippodrome and make some populist moves. Debts and arrears of taxation were annulled, donatives and other treats were handed out, and to the aristocracy's delight, the compulsory loans which Justinian had occasionally demanded of them were cancelled. A short time later, a small purge took care of a couple of allegedly conspiring senators and the other likely candidate for the throne, Germanus's son, Justin. Justin II was born around 520, and although I can't find a source which tells me where he was born, it may well have been in Constantinople. His great-uncle would have been emperor, and we assume that he received the education and upbringing that would come from such biological and physical proximity to the emperor. Now aged 45, Justin seems to have been confident that he could take on his uncle's legacy and improve upon it if not in great conquests, then at least in the quality of governance, which had perhaps slipped as the emperor grew older. In reality, though, Justin was no Justinian. 
He did not possess his uncle's understanding of the geopolitical situation and may not have had the mental health to hold the stressful position of emperor. One thing Justin was certain of was that the Roman Empire should not be paying tribute to anyone. As you know, Justinian was not afraid to use gold to solve his diplomatic issues. The old emperor had realized that he couldn't fight on more than one front at a time, and so it was best to pay off enemies now than try to fight them all at once later. Justin, along with many of his contemporaries, strongly disagreed. They saw it as a humiliation for the empire to be paying off foreign peoples, instead of dealing with them as the Romans of old had done, at the end of a sword. But these were not the old days of Rome, and everyone was about to be reminded of that fact. Shortly after Justin's reign began, an embassy arrived from the Avars. The large confederation forming on the Danube had sent men to congratulate the new emperor, and to ask for some cash, as proof that their alliance would continue as before. Justin refused. The Avar envoys returned home and reported the bad news to the Avar Kargan Bayan. Without written Avar sources, we rely on what Byzantine authors understood of the Avar political structure. The Kaganate that had been formed over the last couple of decades simply means empire or confederation. And the ruler of this Kaganate was the Kargan, the emperor or Khan, the chief of chiefs or king of kings if you like. As I've mentioned already, the key detail from our point of view is the similar political and military structures which the Avars shared with the Huns. As you know from the history of Rome, Attila and his predecessors were nomadic steppe warriors who fought on horseback using powerful bows, which remained the premier military technology of the time. The Avars followed in this tradition and used the peoples they conquered to fight within their armies, creating massive, varied groups of soldiers, all being led by ruthless horse archers. The Romans had spent centuries pitting one tribe against another, and the arrival of a force who could unite all these people had led fairly directly to the collapse of the Western Empire. Now the Avars were threatening to create the same conditions as the Huns. Denied subsidies by the Emperor, Bayan decided that his next target would be the land west of the Carpathian Mountains, the future plain of Hungary. The grasslands of the area were the ideal home for the horses of the Avars, as they had been for Attila. But that area was currently the site of ongoing conflict between the Gepids and the Lombards. Bayan sent word to the Lombard king Alboin, suggesting a joint offensive. The Gepids were attacked on both sides and utterly destroyed so much so that the Gepids actually ceased to be an independent people, their remnants being absorbed by the victorious powers or fleeing to the empire. Justin, for his part, was glad to see the Gepids go and retook the imperial city of Sirmium on the Danube. But King Alboin could see what the emperor couldn't. After the Gepids were defeated, the Avars began demanding more land and more treasure from the Lombards. Alboin could see that the Avars were never going to be peaceful neighbours. Their domains now stretched all the way back to the Volga River in modern Russia, and the Lombards would soon be crushed if they resisted further encroachment. The year 567 would begin a rude awakening for Justin on just how hard it was to govern the empire. In that year, Alboin led the Lombards south, across the Alps, and into Italy. Many of his retainers had fought with Narses only 15 years before, and told their king that the former land of the great Romans would make a good home. As the Lombards moved their entire nation away from the Danube, the Avars greedily occupied the area, 
and made a violent raid on Dalmatia. Tiberius, the Count of the Excubitors and friend of the Emperors, was sent to repel them, and would spend three futile years chasing at shadows as the raiders could dart back and forth across the now entirely Avar-controlled Danube frontier. Meanwhile, the Lombards met little resistance in Italy. By the end of 567, they had taken Venetia, and by 569, they had occupied most of the land north of the Po. During peacetime, the Byzantines didn't keep standing armies massed in one place. They simply garrisoned key towns and forts. There was no army capable of standing against the whole Lombard nation, and after decades of plague and war, there was little appetite for resistance amongst the Italians. A few coastal cities were able to hold out, and Pavia resisted for so long that when Alboin took it after a three-year siege, he made it his capital. The Lombards took most of Tuscany, but steered clear of Rome and Ravenna. The leader of the imperial army, Longinus, who had taken over from Narses, was content to protect Ravenna and the surrounding areas. The Lombards knew that the Byzantines could resupply coastal cities by sea, and so Alboin halted his advance in the north. However, several Lombard nobles and their followers pressed south to the centre of the country, where they set up two independent duchies at Spoleto and Benevento. Many towns they encountered were easy to take because their defences had been destroyed in the wars between Goth and Byzantine. These Lombard dukes enjoyed the distance between them and their king and were content to let the Romans use the Via Flaminia, which led from Rome to Ravenna, to help maintain their newly won independence. But whether in the north or the south, the Lombards made it clear that they were here to stay. Alboin knew that for his people to avoid the fate of the Goths, they needed to mix with the existing population. Adopting the Italian language, religion, and intermarrying with the locals, the Lombards put down roots, which would last for centuries. The remaining Italians under Byzantine control had to adapt to their new life, living either in fortified towns or in exposed country, which the Lombards could raid without much fear. Although the blame doesn't rest entirely with Justinian, this is the point where one can observe that the old senatorial class and Roman way of life really had been destroyed by the emperor's attempted reconquest. The Italy of a century before was no longer a reality. If that wasn't bad enough news for the new emperor, then reports from Spain and Africa would further furrow his brow. The Visigoths in Spain began their counterattack, taking both Seville and Cordova by the early 570s, while the Moorish king Germal led a revolt down in Africa and killed two Byzantine generals who were sent to restore order. Together with further outbreaks of plague, the situation in the west couldn't have looked worse from Constantinople. But Justin had other things on his mind. The emperor was rather embarrassed to discover that having come to power throwing debts to one side, he was now short of money. Only four years after being crowned, he introduced new taxes on bread and wine, which were terribly unpopular and seen by the masses as imperial greed. It's easy to see from this why Justinian kept soaking the rich. No one will take to the streets when you pick the pockets of millionaires. So there would be no reinforcements for the West while the Emperor was struggling to keep his finances in the black. And a series of events now conspired to send the Emperor over the edge. Literally, to drive him mad. During the 560s, a debate had opened up amongst the Monophysites when a few radicals had gone too far and declared that each member of the Trinity had a distinct nature. This belief led to mainstream Monophysites accusing them of a return to polytheism, seeing Jesus, God and the Holy Spirit as distinct deities. 
As Monophysite leaders began to re-clarify their position, Justin and his patriarch decided to swoop. The Monophysites were now being forced to say explicitly that God could have more than one nature, but still be one being. This was exactly what the Council of Chalcedon said, that Jesus was one person with two natures. So what have we spent all this time arguing about? Leading Monophysites, including Jacob Baradius himself, came to Constantinople at the Emperor's invitation and agreed to sign an Act of Union in 571. The Act confirmed that what was laid down at Chalcedon did not in fact contradict the beliefs of the Monophysites. Once signed, all those taking part took communion with the Patriarch. Could it be that the most insuperable problem of the day had finally been overcome? Sadly, no. The decades-long struggle over the Council of Chalcedon had become an important part of the Monophysite way of life. When the bishops out in Egypt and Syria told their flocks about the Act of Union, there was outrage. How could they approve anything which endorsed the blasphemous Chalcedon? In order to maintain their own authority, many Eastern bishops withdrew their support for the Act, and Justin responded angrily to what he saw as betrayal, and imprisoned bishops, banned Monophysite worship, and gave up on any future negotiation. Oh, what Justinian would have given for such an opportunity. With the emperor's blood boiling, he responded yet again in a manner his uncle would not have done. Appeals came to Justin from several different sources, urging him to return to war with Persia. The first calls came from Yemen. Back in episode 15, I described the alliance made between the Christians of Aksum, or Ethiopia, and the Byzantines in order to take control of Yemen and the trade that came through the Red Sea. Since then, a native prince had gone to Kusro asking for help to push out the foreigners from Aksum. Kusro had sent troops in, but installed a Persian governor to make sure the area was properly run. And the native Christians now appealed to Justin. Closer to home, similar calls came from the Christian Armenians living on the Persian side of the border. They were planning rebellion and asking for the empire to assist them. And finally, there came an embassy from the Turks. The Turkic peoples is a term we use to describe a collection of ethnic groups whose languages belong to the same Turkic family. At this time, they populated various areas along the Silk Road, which runs from Europe all the way to China. Today, there are Turkic peoples living in dozens of countries, including major populations in Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and of course, Turkey. There remains a lot of historical speculation about the ethnic identity of the various steppe tribes, and it's possible that Turkic peoples were involved in all of the major groups in our story so far, Huns, Bulgars, and Avars. In most cases, we just don't know but the embassy which reached Justin II was most definitely from a Turkic people. The representatives who came to Constantinople were in the employ of Sizibul, the Kargan of the Turkic Kaganate, sometimes known in history books as the Gok Turks. The Turkic Kaganate was formed in the Civil War, which saw the Hephthalites defeated by Khusro and the Avars flee into Europe. Now, Sizibul, the Kargan, wanted an alliance with the Byzantines in order to fight the Persians. Khusro had rebuffed the Kargan, presumably afraid that the Turks would simply replace the Hephthalites as a menace on their northern border. So Sizibul sent word to Justin that they should launch a joint offensive. Zamarkos, the master of soldiers for the east, was sent to the court of Sizibul in August 569 to agree terms. Zimarchus and his party had to head north of the Black Sea and cross what is now southern Russia, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, some 2,000 miles. Sizibul's seat of power was somewhere around the borders of modern Mongolia, China and Russia. And by the time Zimarchus returned, Justin was ready for war. 
as we saw repeatedly during Justinian's reign, when the Persians concentrated forces on their western front, they were too strong for the Byzantines. This was why Justinian went to such great lengths not to fight on multiple fronts and to pay for peace rather than fight for it. When 572 arrived, Justin took delight in refusing to pay any more of the gold that was owed from the peace of 562 and told Khusro that the Christians of Armenia were now under his protection. The emperor's cousin Marcion was sent to lead an attack on Persian Mesopotamia. In a moment that should have warned the emperor against what he was doing, he was forced to pay off the Avars so as to free up troops to head east. The cost of this truce was more than the subsidies which the Avars had asked for on his accession. Justin's control was clearly slipping. With crises on multiple fronts, to begin a war with Persia was a terrible decision. Although he justified it as the necessary response of a Christian emperor to a call for help, it seems a little like a desperate bid for legitimacy. Marcion scattered the Persian troops on the border and began a siege of Nisbis. Nisbis was, of course, the key to Persian defence and was therefore heavily fortified. Any siege was going to take a long time and that was something Justin wasn't prepared for. Losing patience with the delay, the emperor sent messengers dismissing Marcion from his post before his successor could arrive. The bewildered army camped outside the city woke up one morning to two pieces of news. Their commander had been fired, and Khusro was on his way with a large army. Naturally, they fled back in disorder across the border, and Khusro's men sacked the city of Apamea, and sent a raiding party with the Lakhmid Arabs into Syria. Here again, Justin's disastrous diplomacy struck. By this time, Harith, the leader of the Ghassanids, had died, and was replaced by his son al Mundir. Confusing, I know, because that was also the name of the former Lakhmid chief that Harith killed. The new Lakhmid chief, Kabus, had tried to exploit the succession by attacking the Ghassanids, but al Mundir was up to the challenge, drove the Lakhmids back, and then invaded their territory, gaining an important victory. Fresh from these successes, al Mundir wrote to Justin asking for money for his men, as befitted victorious imperial troops. Justin, of course, wasn't about to pay off some foreign tribe, and instead sent a letter to Marcion ordering him to kill al Mundir. Unfortunately, the letter fell into Ghassanid hands. Outraged by this order, al Mundir refused to fight for the Byzantines, and for the next three years he ignored their ambassadors. As the Persians and Lakhmids began raiding Syria, they faced almost no resistance, and the people of the area suffered greatly from the emperor's bungling. Worse was to come, though. Khusro picked up the abandoned siege equipment from outside Nisbis and marched to Dara, the key Byzantine fortress only a few miles away. Justin was apparently unable to organise a relieving army, and after a six-month siege and bitter street fighting, the Persians took the city in November 573. The city built by Anastasius and reinforced by Justinian had fallen to the Persians, and there was now no anchor to the defence of the east. The Persians could now attack whenever they wanted, in multiple directions. According to our sources, the shock of this loss, and recognition of his part in it, broke the emperor. His already erratic behaviour now gave way to bouts of violent insanity, Bars had to be fitted to the windows of the palace to stop him jumping out of them, and attendants frequently had to wrestle him to the ground. The emperor would bite anyone who came near him, and left such horrible marks on some of his servants that by the time the news reached the streets of Constantinople, the rumour was out that the emperor had eaten two of his chamberlains. Effective control of the government passed to Sophia, she had to make key decisions while the emperor was soothed by his attendants. 
Apparently they played music all day long to try and calm him, and he seemed to enjoy being dragged about the palace in a small cart. I haven't been able to find modern medical speculation about what the emperor's condition was. Schizophrenia, or some other kind of mental illness seems possible, or it may be that the stress of being emperor really did cause a kind of temporary insanity. It certainly wasn't the madness of earlier emperors, because to Justin's credit, in one of his lucid moments, he agreed with his wife's counsel that he needed to appoint another emperor to take on the burdens of office. The man for the job was to be Tiberius, the emperor's friend, count of the excubitors, and by now, an experienced general. Sophia wrote personally to Kusro and sent 45,000 pieces of gold to obtain a one-year truce. In December 574, Tiberius was made Caesar and took over day-to-day -day rule of the empire. In two weeks' time, we will get to know the new man at the top and see how he gets on digging himself out of the hole that Justin had left the empire in. Thank you for listening. And for your iTunes reviews, please keep them coming. And find me on Facebook or at thehistoryofbyzantium.com. <laughs>